Thank you, Don. Thank you. Um, I just want to open up in prayer, if you'll just join me in prayer. Whew. Lord, I come to you as a humble servant. Just allow the words that come out of our mouths to be pleasing to you. I pray that what we share will just penetrate hearts of those who, and provide some benefit from what we have to say. Use us as your vessels to be beneficial in your service, Lord, and help the attention not to be on us, but the focus to be on you, Lord. I pray this in your holy and precious name, dear Lord. Amen. Amen. I'll start with introducing myself, and then I'll turn it over to Van. Um, when our church, Siler, left PC USA about 10 years ago, I told the Lord, um, I want to be involved at the denominational level. Well, within a month after coming in, <laughs> they asked me to serve on the CDC. So I've served on the CDC since then, and I think the Lord really put stepping stones along the way to kind of help you in your path, you know. He gives you a little bit, encourages you, and pushes you on, and pushes you on, and um, he's continued to do that throughout my um, serving at the Presbyterian, at the denominational level, and um, I think he prepares you for each one of those stepping stones as he pushes, and sometimes he has to prod, and today's another one of those stepping stones to me. I didn't ask to be up here, <laughs> just so you know. I asked Ben to be up here, and he said, I'll do it if you come with me, Anita. Well, I don't ask anybody to do anything that I wouldn't do myself, so here we are. We're together. <laughs> so I, I'm Anita Hill, if I didn't say that, but I want to turn it over to Ben to introduce himself. Thanks, Anita. Hey, good afternoon everybody how are y'all doing today good 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 I'm excited to be here but it's obvious that I wasn't at the last Presbyterian meeting because like Anita said she volunteered me they came back and said hey Van you're speaking <laughs> at the next Presbytery meeting and I was like what I don't remember raising my hand in fact I don't even remember driving there <laughs> but she, but she got me here but you know sometimes the best defense is a good offense and I said I'll only get up there if you get up there with me. <laughs> now, the reason I say that is because I've been a ruling elder at Siler now for uh, four terms uh, as an elder at Siler. And when I first came in as an elder, Anita was already on the session. Right? And, I knew, and I learned from her, and I, and, I, and I respect the guidance that she gave me as a, as a, as a rookie on the, on, the, on the session that I had, I had uh, Anita and others like her that said, let me help you understand what we're doing, how we're doing this, how we best function, and, and where do we go from there. So, yeah, Anita, you, uh, you suckered me up here, and it <laughs> turned right around and got you up here as well. But we're, we're, th we're thrilled to be here, y'all. We, we really are. And it feels a little strange, folks, to be up here talking to this room because I don't feel worthy for number one. And second of all, we're here to talk about the role of ruling elder. Well... If you're in this room and you're an elder on your church and you've made the trip to Presbytery, I'm looking at the committed faithful here, right? It's not that, th that this is where we expect to make a big change. And now I'm on the drive up here, I'm going, wow, I'm wondering if Anita's got me up here for me to learn something. So, <laughs> so we'll, 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 see how this, we'll see how this goes from there. So we're going to give this our, our best shot, folks. We want to share with you some concepts that we've talked about. Anita and I have been working for a, for a month or so getting ready for this conversation. And we wanted to keep it at a certain level that, to just talk about what is this role of ruling elder and how can I and Anita and you as ruling elders possibly do it better. So I know we just had a break, but I'm going to ask you. Ruling elders in the room, thank you, Jill. Please stand up. <laughs> I want to see where our audience is. Okay. There's our audience, and actually it looks like it's more than half good. the room, yeah. which going back to what Don said, this is where, who we are as EPC, right? We're, we're an elder-led uh, denomination. Thank you for standing up. I appreciate that. So let's get going with this just a little bit. So let's see if I get this right up there, John. There we go. I remember walking into my first session meeting as an elder, and I'm coming into this where I'm, I'm like, okay, this is going to be interesting. And I thought of it, the world was represented kind of like this. Like, okay, there's going to be this big spiritual component of what we do and our mission and what we're trying to accomplish. And then there's this other part of business that we have to get done, right? We watched the room in here change a little bit from the hymns we were singing to moving over to our stated clerk and having conversations about Robert's rules of order and where are we going and all those types of things. 
And this was my belief as to how things look. Raise your hand if you're, if you're an elder and think that's the way things looked or you've had that impression before. Okay, kind of kind of like that. But there are times when I sat there and I came in with the wrong impression and I came in <laughs> and thought things were sometimes like this. <laughs> right? Right? Do we ever get there? Raise your hand if you've been in a meeting like this before. Yes, yes. we have. <laughs> We've all been in meetings like this before. And some of it's natural to us as who we are. Not only are we, not only are we fallen creatures, but a lot of us as ruling elders are coming out of the business world, right? We zoom out of a meeting at 5.30 in the afternoon, and we fly to the church for our session meeting, sit down at 7 o'clock, and we're still totally in this mode over here. In a lot of ways, too much, we bring that in with us, right? So I've been there. I felt that in my, in my first term as, as an elder when we were going through this. But then... I really think it needs to be more like this, mm -hmm. right? Keeping these things in perspective and keeping the size of what we're focused on, our eyes on the prize. What are we trying to accomplish? Yes, the business is important. How many are on the baptized role versus how many are on the active role, right? We're, that's one we're dealing with at Siler right now. Mm -hmm. we, yeah, we, we went in a circle on that one for a while. But, but that's, that's part of doing the, the business of the church. But we need to make sure that we're focused on the spiritual side of the church. Now, most of you shook your head and said that you agreed more with this diagram. But I'm going to suggest is another way. And it really is this, right? It really is making certain that in all things we're doing, we're being led by the Lord on the mission that he has us on. Whether we're paying the power bill, right? Right? Or, 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 whether, or whether we're preaching from the pulpit, whether we're teaching, whether we're leading, no matter what we're doing, we need to have that representation in all that we do. And it feels so weird saying this here because I've been, in, I've been here now for a few hours and I've watched an entire meeting today that is doing exactly this. This is exactly what I've witnessed here today. And I mean, that is, for, for, the, for the PCC, that is a phenomenal testimony that you presented to me today. It, it hit me really strongly sitting back there and hearing the conversations and what was going on and, and hearing from, uh, from uh, you, Rosemary, about what's going on at a national level and the speech that you gave, I was really lifted to hear that I think we've got this structure and we're blessed to have this. And the more that we have this, we know we're on the right path. You ever feel like that? I have. Ooh, gee whiz. What is this? Broken chain. Broken chain, the weakest link. <laughs> holding it together. You ever feel like that in life? You're trying to hold you're holding two things together and you're that weakest link in there? I know I have, right? And this is the opportunity, folks, for us to talk about the rest of our conversation we want to go on the path of. How do we improve on this situation of where we are? When I first joined our session, I felt like I was a weak excuse me, the weakest link in the room. Right? And why was that? And where was I? And how was I coming at this? And how do I improve myself as an individual so that I'm strengthening our leadership of our local congregation and being influential to all, uh, to all, of, those, uh, all of those around us? So let's go to it. Let's go to the mission. What is the mission of a ruling elder? It really is quite simple, folks. Step number one. Represent the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. Wow. That sounds simple. Sounds simple. Challenging. Difficult. We can all find that, right? And I'm sure you're all saying, wow, that's, that's number one. What's number two? <laughs> <laughs> right? So it is that simple. <laughs> It is that simple. And we need to make certain, folks, that all we do is ruling elders. If we start here, if this is who we show up as, if this is who we are and attempting to be, we can make all the difference in our role as where we're called as a ruling leader. It is about representing that mind of Christ. Today, you are the body, you are the hands, you are the eyes, you are the mouth of Christ in this world. And how do we represent him? And, and can we do that? So, here we go, folks. 
how do we have to pursue this, this mission? This is where it gets tough. This is where it gets tough for me. The circle up there. We have to pursue it humbly. Right? I heard, Rosemary, I think you talked about leadership and how are we developing leaders and where are we going with leadership. And we have to make certain that we are developing ourselves as humble leaders. Now, the problem or the challenge there sometimes is humble sounds like what? Weak. Thank you. What else? Passive. Okay? Those types of things come to mind as when we think about humble, right? Oh, it's me. I'm, I'm going to be humble. I'm quiet. I'm meek and I'm timid. Is that what the Lord calls us to be? No, it is not. Thank you. It is not. So I think there's another side of this coin, and it's about being accountable, right? I'm speaking to the ruling elders in this room. You have been called by the Holy Spirit to be accountable, to discern the mind of Christ, and to lead. And accountable is about us taking action, doing, and being. Now, you'll notice these two circles overlap here, right? And I did that visual on purpose because it's really about threading this needle that's tough. It's tough for me. And I'm looking forward to learning from you while I'm here because somewhere in the middle here is this. Right? That's the needle we need to thread, and that's what we're after. And if we get this right, folks, and we understand the mission, and we're pursuing it in this manner, we're on the course that the Lord is looking for. I'm just thinking about how many times I've missed that course, right? And it happens, and we course correct all the time, right? A plane today will leave Charlotte, North Carolina, headed to Seattle, Washington. Rosemary, that's getting you close to home, I guess. Perhaps you're, perhaps you're on it, right? It is not a direct line, and we're never on a direct line. We're going to have to course correct as we go along. And at every stage, we make course corrections. But it's only when we remember who we are and what our calling is and are in prayer and contact with the Lord that we know that. So this is how we want to get on the field. We want to get on this field as athletes in the body of Christ with this servant leader uh, mindset. So the question is, how do we get prepared? How do we get prepared to be on the field as that servant leader? And I love this quote by, by, by Oswald Sanders. Spiritual goals can be achieved only by spiritual people who use spiritual methods. You know, Oswald Sanders is a, is, is a great author, and I can tell you this, because the Lord works in mysterious ways. I'm going to hold this up. Butch is going to laugh because he and I and a group of other men have been, work, have been working our way through this book over the past 12 months. I'm almost embarrassed to show you how thin it is that it took 12 <laughs> months to go, through the, to go through this book, but it did. The title, folks, is Spiritual Leadership. And, right, I'm going to give you a second, ruling elders. Grab your pen, grab your paper, write down Spiritual Leadership, Sanders. I highly encourage you to get a copy. I highly encourage you to consider buying a copy for the rest of the members of your session. It has made an impactful difference to me from a leadership perspective. And I can say that after getting uh, Butch, maybe, what do we call it, at least an associate's degree. We spent a whole year in it. So we, 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 were, we worked pretty hard on, on that. And that, that can make a big difference as to who you are and where you are. But Anita, this is one that we pulled out, right? Yep. Being prepared for, for the mission. There are three things that we're after. Yep. So this came from Experiencing God um, by the Blackabees, which uh, that book, you know, has some really powerful things in it. And um, this was a quote. When you offer yourself to God as his servant, he first expects to shape you into the instrument of his choosing. He will work in you before he works through you. And so there's three things about this. First, you've got to be moldable. You know, we're supposed to be like that piece of clay. We're not that hard piece of clay. We're that moldable piece of clay. You know, so you've got to be flexible. You've got to be willing to change. You've got to be available. So what does that mean? Time, a priority. You know, you've got to make it your focus. And then you've got to be obedient. You've got to listen to what, the God, what God's t telling you to do and then do it. You know, you can't just hear it or just know about it. You've got to pursue it. So, yeah, love that. Thanks, Anita. So, guys, we've now got to get prepared for the, for the mission. 
We know what the mission is. We know what our role is. We know how we're trying to thread that needle and be the servant leader. Before we show up and become active as ruling elders, we have to get in shape, right? At work, I often talk about, give me the athlete, and I'll teach him the sport, right? So what kind of athlete are you? Are you in shape? How fast do you run the 40? How, right? How much can you bench press? That's not what we're looking for here, though. What type of shape are we in? What type of shape is our relationship with the Lord in? Right? Before and during and always, we need to make certain that we're individually in the Word. This is our basic training. This is where we get to basic camp and we, and we take away our training for being in the word of the Lord and making certain that we're coming to this. Through that, the Lord will give us the talents and skills that we need. At the same time, there's no place like on your knees in prayer about what we're doing and how we're going as ruling elders. Before, during, and after, guys. This is how we need to show up to our session. Showing up as... as, as one that is strengthened in our, in our sports ability, in our workout bit, that we're ready to play the game of being a ruling elder. And with that, those two things, I think your link and my link can be made better. I have no doubt that my link can be made better, right? And not only can we, can we be whole as that link, but now we can truly connect other things, Right? And that's what the body of Christ is all about. It's about connectivity, right? About reaching out, ca capturing, the, capturing the lost and bringing, and bringing them to the Lord. And so, you know, I think this is a great graphical representation of the completeness that we're trying to become through Christ, right? And I know we all show up, and I know I show up, is that weak link in the chain, and only through him can this be possible. Anita, now that we're in shape, and we're, we're praying, and we're reading in the world, and we're submerged, and we know the mission is to, is to represent the mind of Christ, what then we need to do? Yeah, and today we're focused on four things. I mean, there's so much. We could stand up here all day and talk to you all about this stuff because we're so passionate about it. I mean, we love serving in this way. And um, so, but, you know, we're, talk, we're training ourselves at the same time. So I th I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But when you learn something and when you study something, you know, the teacher gets blessed a lot more than the students. So, you know, thank you for the privilege of being here in front of you today. But we're, we're also teaching ourselves through this process. But there are four things we want to focus on. Um, teaching, shepherding, unifying, and leading. And so I'm just going to talk about each one of those a little bit. I'll start with teaching. And I, I love this visual that says I love to tell the story because this is Jesus' story, but it's our story too. And that is just such a wonderful little, it's like a nugget to my heart, you know, that don't we all love to tell the story? I mean, that's the part of what we're doing through evangelism is telling the story. And we all have our testimony as a story. Um, so um, how do we do that? Well, there's a whole host of ways we can do it. You know, I listed a few here, small group, Bible study, youth leader, one-on-one. -on -one. But really, I mean, there's a ton of different ways Jesus calls us, and we just need to listen to what he's asking us to do personally. You know, what does that look like for us? You know, I think he all asks us all to tell our story. So we just need to figure out, you know, which one of these things is about us, you know. And maybe we can help with youth. Maybe we're better with older people. Maybe we're great with children. But, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, as we go about our day and go about our life, he asks us to share. And so we just need to be ready, willing, and able to do that. Um, one thing I read said, when you hear a message the first time, it makes an indentation in you. And then you hear it again. It kind of gets a little deeper. And you hear it again and again and again. It kind of becomes embedded in you. And so some things today we say, and Nate might repeat, you know, you might need to hear them a couple of times. In the Bible, when you hear something over and over again, you better pay attention because God's probably speaking to you. And maybe you hear, you might be hearing something somebody else just pass right over. So, but just pay attention to that. The other thing I would say in worship, 
you know, this one's a little uncomfortable for us typically, you know, because we as elders, oh, I mean, yeah, I'd like to, I'll go to the meeting and I'll make whatever, do whatever I need to do there, but I like to be behind the scenes, you might think. No, God's calling you to be in the front. Um, that might mean scripture reading. It might mean teaching during worship. That means preaching. <laughs> Is that not a scary thing? You know, and when I was <laughs> when I was studying about this, you know, one thing that I was like, whoa, okay, that's a little different is that in the Bible, when it talks about elders, it doesn't say ruling elder do this and teaching elder nope. do this. It says elder. It means all of us. You know, so it doesn't call just the teaching elder to preach the word. We all are supposed to be ready and willing to preach the word. Is that not a scary thing? <laughs> I mean, if you didn't already feel like you're ill-equipped for this job, I mean, now you're probably starting to feel like, whoa, what is it I signed up for? <laughs> because that's not something we feel comfortable doing. Um, also, just kind of, kind of tie that knot, the Book of Order also says... We're, we're supposed to be willing to do those things too. It actually says the RE shares, shares the authority with the TE and all the courts of the church in both rights and duties. And it goes on to say the RE, um, RE should study and learn the word and become equipped to teach that word. An RE should be adept at leading worship and in leading prayer. That's our book of order. You know, I mean, we all should be aware of that, but, you know, until we really dive in and say, what is it exactly? Now, I'll give you this. <clears throat> the paid pastor is, of course, more well-equipped. He's trained. He has, I say time, but I think any teaching older in here would probably dispute that somewhat. But he has the gifting to be able to do that more readily. But that doesn't give us an out. I mean, we still have to be willing to do that and step in whenever we're required to do that. Kind of think about <clears throat> if you've ever, hopefully you haven't, but if your house has ever been caught, caught on fire and you had to call the fire department, you don't say, well, um, could you make sure that a paid fire fire comes to my house? <laughs> no, you don't care who it is. You just want somebody to fight that fire. Same thing with, you know, the people in our congregation. They want people to love on them, to care for them, to be there for them. It doesn't, it really doesn't matter that it's a paid person or a volunteer. We're all called to do the same thing. So that's that piece. And then model maturity. <clears throat> First Corinthians 11, 1 says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. People should notice you for good reasons, <laughs> for the positive reasons, right? I mean, they should see who you are on Sunday. You should be that same person throughout the week. You should be that same person in social media. You should be that same person all over. You know, so, you know, you should be, represent Christ, whatever you're doing, because people recognize you as a leader of the church, and they associate you with that church. I mean, let me interrupt you there. I really Go. love that modeling maturity and be <laughs> worth imitating. That's a daunting feeling, isn't it? Somebody, somebody wanting to imitate. Yeah, Jill, you're laughing because you know me really well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but, folks, let me let me just touch on the elephant in the room. Look around. What's the average age in this room? We're old. We're old. <laughs> That's right. We're old. We're old, right? So, who are we mentoring? I want to call that out right now. When we yeah. talk about talk about modeling maturity. I don't think it's just be the model, be the passive model that someone sees and reflects on. And yeah. let me check their faith. Oh, yeah, they're still Christian. Anita's still Christian. Look, that's really nice. <laughs> it, it aligns. No, I think it's incumbent upon us, our generation, the generation in this room, to actively find those young people. And I don't, some find them as a group is wonderful. Wonderful. Finding them as individuals and mentoring them where they are. And bringing them along to where they will be the representative sitting in your chair that you're sitting in right now, 45 years from now. Yeah. Who's going to be sitting there? Yep. And I'm really calling on everybody here to say, think about identifying that one person that you want to make a difference in their life and say, I think I can help. I'm going to give them whatever the Lord gave me and pour into them what the good Lord poured into me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do it the best I can and lead the rest of the Holy Spirit that that will be the person sitting in this room 45 years from now. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. 
And I would say we're also called to do this, uh, to model life of Christ. And, um, you know, when we do it really good and we look like Christ, then that is perfect. When we do it really bad, then that can be pretty disastrous. So just be aware, you know, just make sure you're modeling the way we should. Let's move over to shepherding. Okay. So the visual of the shepherd, you know, he's in there, he's with the flock. So there's multiple things in shepherding, and I'm just going to kind of go through them. Tending to the flock. I mean, you know, he, he calls us to care, nurture, love, um, do it with enthusiasm and eagerly. You know, not just to, you know, okay, I feel like loving this person today and mm, don't really want to love that one, so I'm going to steer away from that one. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to love the church. Um, we should have a heart for it, a heart for people. Um, smell like sheep. The only way you're going to smell like sheep is if you're with a sheep, and I mean really with sheep. <laughs> so you got to be in there amongst them. You know, you got to get your hands dirty. you got to touch them and let them know that you love them. you got to... Uh, be around them, and um, people, you should see people really as your ministry. That's what you're there for. Um, do life with them, you know, and not just on Sunday. Do life with them and really immerse yourself in them and let them know that you love them. Um, protect the sheep. We're supposed to be the overseers of the sheep. If somebody's trying to bring harm to the church, then it's your job to protect them and stop it. And sometimes we might think, oh, harm to the church. You know, how's that going to happen? But, you know, it can be just the smallest little ways. Harmful words, gossip, somebody trying to push their agenda, somebody having selfish ambition. Um, it can be even sometimes an elder in the church. Um, if it's going against the unity of the church, then it's harmful, and it's your job to protect the church. And, again, this is for ruling elders. That's not just the pastor's job. You know, you've got to step up and help the pastor. It's, you know, he's not out there doing this all by himself. You know, you're out there helping him and be an advocate for the congregation. Um, help the limping sheep. You know, especially during COVID, good grief, we had a lot of people that felt like they were limping alone, you know, and still do. You know, we have, in Siler, we have a lot of widows right now, and I just, you know, have a heart for that, you know, and so... You know, there's people like that. You have people that are just having health problems. You have people that have young children and might just need some help. When, when you have a limping sheep, then the things kind of other people are kind of moving fast, but that person's moving a little slower. And so you need to slow down and walk with them and be with them at their pace, not at your pace. Because we sometimes we get in a hurry and we just don't want to bother or we don't even notice. So I just say slow down and make sure you're helping that, um, that sheep that might be having a hard time. Um, you don't have to own their problems. God's going to take care of that. So, you know, you just want to be there for them. Um, track down the strays. Again, COVID's been a challenge for all of our churches, I think. You know, some people just aren't coming back to church. And so the elder's job also is to be accountable for those that aren't attending church. You know, why are they not coming? You know, they have other interests or activities that have pulled them away from the church. You know, it's our job to go outreach to them, find out. You know, they might not be attending because they're limping, and you just don't know about it. And we're supposed to be there to care and put our arms around them. And so, and I mean, we have yeah. to overcome, team, what, what the culture has done to us. Anita just mentioned COVID. It sprung to mind to me. Remember when this whole thing started and things were called essential and non-essential, and people were called essential, and non-essential people. Right? Do we remember? Do we remember this, right? And I can remember talking to our minister at the time. And I'm like, Bruce Powell. We had the conversation about people right now are deciding what is essential and non-essential in their lives, mm -hmm. and it's time for us as the church to step up and to call back to the to, to those lost, to those strays, to make certain that they know the most essential thing in their life is not what the government is saying and not what not what the health conditions are but but what the kingdom of Jesus Christ is all about and we need we need to drive that and actually go bring back those strays that's really upon my heart right now as to as to what we've done over the past three years and where we are as, as a church universal yeah we can move on to uh, unify 
unified. I'm going to look up here because my eyes are really that's, that's, that's hard to read from here, isn't it? Yeah. Unified uh, in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another and what you say, and that there will be no divisions among you, that you will be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's a pretty hefty uh, requirement, isn't it? Um, I think of it as kind of shalom. You know, nothing out of place, everything as it ought to be. Um, Numbers 6, 24, 26 says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift, you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Those words are so comforting. Peace. It's not the absence of conflict, but it's in the favor of being in the favor of God. The um, only way we can find this peace is through God. Galatians 3.28 says that we're all one in Christ. We're bound to each other for eternity. Um, be one so the, Lord, so the world will believe. John 17.21 says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. To me, I just think, you know, I mean, we're sending a message. He says, so the world may believe that you have sent me. The unity, whether we're unified or not, is going to show people around us God. You know, it's going to... We, we present a picture of unification when somebody comes to our church and they see things that are not unified, then they're going to not experience what God has for them there. They're going to pay attention to things that they shouldn't even be paying attention to or see within our churches. And so we just need to make sure that we're unified. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're the family, the family of God. Um, but we have so many differences. Um, financial views, different views of music, different views of how politics should work. But our differences should bring us together. Those differences, we should build each other up through those. Um, they shouldn't divide us, so we just need to be careful about that. Life's too short not to love the people around you. And, um, you know, Jesus was never in a hurry. He was never rushed. He always took his time, especially with people. You know, people were what he was all about, relationships and being with people and teaching people. And we just need to remember that, that people, that's, that's what our mission's all about. And we need to take the time to listen to what God's calling us to do. You know, his plan for each one of us is different. It's not the same. You know, when he's calling each person in here to do something totally different. And sometimes our, you know, what he's calling us to do, you know, we might be on the same path, but he might be calling all of us to do something, you know, completely different. I would say the opposite of unify is um, strife, division, conflict. Um, and Rosemary talked about a little bit, you know, conflict. You know, we're not so great in the church of dealing with conflict. Um, we really like to say, mm, I think I'm just not even going to pay attention to that. I'm sure it will go away on its own. Nah, it doesn't work that way. Well, you can't avoid it. You've got to address it. And the sooner you address it, the sooner it's going to be better because then you can work towards improvement. You just can't avoid it. Um, and so, you know, I would say if you have a conflict in your church, you know, I would say, the Bible says go to that person one-on-one -on -one if it's a single person. You know, and again, this is not the pastor's job. We're still talking about the ruling elder. You know, so um, we need to make sure that we're working with the pastor, you know, on things. But if we see something, we should just go ahead and address it. You know, talk to that person. Go to them in love, obviously. Um, you know, we should challenge each other to make peace for the glory of God. Anything to add? No. Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, model how to forgive, uh, pray for each other, and love each other. Just another way for, for unification. Um, it's a decision. I think I heard that a little bit earlier. You know, it's not, you, you don't just go in based upon your feelings. You make a decision that you're going to pray, you're going to love each other, and you're going to be united. So it's not an easy task, but it's a worthy task. 
Um, collective, collective wisdom. Oh, I'm sorry, you jumped ahead for I'm me. Sorry. That's what, that's what, collect, value collective wisdom and not individual, uh, individual opinions. Shepherding is a team sport. You don't do it alone. Being a session is a team. It's not about individuals. The New Testament, every time it talks about elders, it describes them in plural because it's about a team. When, when they're talking about, you know, elders do this, it's always in a team environment. So when you have people that are going off doing their own things and not trying to work as a team, then that's, that's not productive. Um, so we just need to work together, round each other out. We all have different gifts, and that's the joy of being a team. You know, when you have somebody on a basketball team or a soccer team or whatever, they don't have the same gifts. You know, one's good at this and one's good at that. Same thing with the elders in your session. You know, you have different gifts you bring to the table. You should know what those gifts are of your team, too, so that you can apply them as you go forward. Um, I mean, let me add something yeah. here. You know, let me ask the ruling elders in here. How many of you have been a part of a vote during your session meeting that was not unanimous. Oh, good. That's excellent. I'm glad to see that, right? Because we have often almost joked but encouraged ourselves that if all of our votes at Siler are 12 to nothing, are we dealing with the important things or are we voting that Jesus Christ is Lord? All hand, yes, we're all in, right? The sun's going to come up tomorrow. Yes, we're all in. Are we dealing with things that are of importance? And are we understanding the collective wisdom and the individual opinions in the room? And are we extracting about and are we really focused on those key issues that we need to be? Right? Now, the art of it is what Anita said here is about being able to have those nine to three votes, understanding where that is, and moving forward in togetherness, right? That's where that's where the unity really of the body comes through. Yeah, and one thing I would say about that too is. You know, we're all going to have passionate um, opinions about things. You know, not you. <laughs> yes. Not you. <laughs> yes. Anybody who knows me knows. Um, so, but when you leave that room as a session, there's no parking, parking lot, lot conversations. There's no conversations about well, I didn't agree with Van in that meeting, but that's what they decided to do. No, the session decided to do this, and I support that decision. And there's nothing else discussed outside. So just want to say that too, you know, you got to be banded together. And just one other thing about this, um, the elders need shepherding too. So they're there to be a shepherd to the people, but we, you know, we need shepherding too. So that can happen two ways. We can shepherd each other. You know, I can support Van, love him as a brother, encourage him, give him feedback when he needs that feedback, you know, but then also the pastor can do that. So if, the, if we do a better job, and again, I'm talking for ourselves too, if we do a better job of going shepherding our people, our congregation, that frees the pastor up to shepherd the elders and teach them better how to go do that and really encourage them more. And because, he, you know, the pastor can't encourage every single person. They can't take all those people under their arm. But if each elder does that, then it kind of, you know, the weight's a little lighter. Um, and then one other thing. One thing I've learned through my career is um, I've been in my job in a couple of weeks. I'll be there 40 years. And so one of the things I've had over 35 different managers. <laughs> and during that time, I've learned some of them I've really perfect, love them, aligned with. You know, some of them not so much. But one thing I've learned is my job is to really make my leader look good. That's true with the elder and the pastor, too. Our job is to lift that pastor up, make him look good, encourage him, make his job easier. And then that really works well for everybody. So I would just encourage you to take that little piece of advice and go with it. Um, leading. Leading. Okay. Final one. Final one. Be a servant leader. It's not about position or visibility. So if you took the role for that reason, you might want to reconsider to accepting that role <laughs> because that's not what it's about. We're to be down in the trenches. We're to be 
putting God before us. God is the true leader of the church. That's not us. There's no man or woman, I'm just going to say it, matriarch, patriarch, person who puts most of the money in the budget. It doesn't matter. Nobody's leading that church but God. So if anything's happening different, remember, your job as the elder is to coach and help and encourage. So go out there and get them. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, model humility. So, you know, just remember when we talked earlier, we we're talking a little bit about humility on the front end and, you know, how we're to just be humble in our position, you know, and it's, it's not about us, not about us at all. Put your pride on the back seat. It's not about you. Value differences. Let your differences bind you, not pull you apart. And then spend quality time together. We are, I think we're all kind of, hmm, I can't think we can all be offended by this. So, you know, we go to our session meetings. We'll spend a couple hours there. We'll see each other on Sunday morning. But do we really spend quality time together to really get to know each other at a deeper level? I think when you have those deeper level um, relationships, then you can speak to each other a little more honestly. You can talk to each other. You know them. You're closer. You're bound together closer. So I just encourage you to do that. Live life together and really try, way, try to find ways to um, deepen those relationships. And then communication. Communication is really important. One-on-one <laughs> -on -one to each other, um, to God, uh, to the congregation. Um, and I don't mean just speaking. I mean listening because that's the other end of it. You know, you have to speak, but you got to take it in too. Um, so it really, I would say, um, just make sure that you communicate. And you cannot never over-communicate. Anything to add to that? No, I don't. Okay. That's great. That's great. So, folks, we're going to wrap up here. And what you've gotten here today is really the long and the short of everything <laughs> that we think about. <laughs> Did I get you, I mean, I just... But, guys, I don't let any meeting end without a call to action, right? We, this is not, we're not watching a nice show on TV and go, well, that was good, and change the channel at the half hour to, over to the next show. This is about taking something and utilizing it and putting it in action. So, so my call to you is, as ruling elders is, Make sure that you are prepared for your mission. Make sure that you go and do your mission. Get involved with the four aspects that Anita took us through there. But always, always remember your mission. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. That was a lot of great stuff. Van, Anita, clearly you all did a lot of work. And thank you so much. Um, the... Um, this actually, the picture that you see is a picture of the, uh, the first session meeting here at Center Presbyterian Church in <laughs> 1788. I, I'd, be, I'd be glad to send that uh, to you, Bob, for 50 bucks. <laughs> actually, I found that picture like a long time ago. That was such a great picture, you know. And uh, if anybody would like that picture, just let me know and I'll send it to you for 10 bucks. Uh, <laughs> Okay. So um, I was having this conversation uh, a couple of months ago with a new couple that had come into St. Giles, and um, they've been attending for a while, and Helen and I got to know them, really liked them, and they were just obvious, like, okay, like, these folks, these are like heavyweights, you know, you can just sort of feel the gravitas around them, and like, so we're getting to know them, how'd you guys end up, and we spent some time with them, and sort of heard this story uh, about how they had been in this church, the, their previous church, for about 25 years, and they had been fully invested. You know, they raised their kids there. They involved in all kinds of ministry and leadership and tithe and did the whole nine yards. And then some way, somehow, uh, the church went through a lot of, um, feels like I'm losing out here. I just think I, I'm not there now. I'm hot again. The church, the church went through a lot of change in a, in a period of a couple of years, and at the end of that change, they begin to realize this is like so different than where we were. And they kind of dug in and they found out that essentially that within the context of a series of fairly dramatic steps, the church merged with another church, the founding pastor retired, they came up with a new set of bylaws and constitution and whatnot, and they figured out, um, so a lot of us feel like, and, and, and the church began to drift more and more into the whole progressive Christianity thing, and it felt like a woke seminar every Sunday. And, and they, they were like, what happened? And what they found out was that unbeknownst to them, through all the transition, 
the bylaws and constitution of the church have been changed, and uh, the new pastor and two other guys, they had all the power and nobody could do a thing. And, you know, we're sitting there, and they're like, you know, we just kind of feel devastated, but, but what do we do? You know, we don't have any recourse, and there's, there's no, this leadership, this new leadership team, they're not under any authority. They're really not answerable to anybody. You know, we're kind of like sunk, and as we were sitting and having lunch, we sort of agreed that, you know, the problem with stuff that you don't know is that you don't know it. And that, that can be a real problem. And in the course of that conversation, as they began to understand more and more how it is that we do things, they're like, oh, this is just, we wish so much that it had been the way you all do it. And that's what I want to talk to you all about today is, is I want to just go through the scriptures. I mean, if you know Nate, what Nate does is Nate just pounds the scriptures, you know. And I'm just going to go through the scriptures uh, about the office specifically of ruling elder, what does the Bible have to say? Uh, for some of you, they'll be like, this will be like nap time. You'll be like, yeah, man, I mean, I like, I've been knowing that for like 30 or 35 years. Uh, some of you will be like, oh, I am actually learning some stuff that I hadn't known before. So I, I just, I, I operate under the assumption that the most helpful thing there is is the Bible. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to do uh, scripture. Okay, now this guy... There we are. All right, so I just did my intro. All right, so let's just talk briefly about the biblical pattern. Let's make sure we understand a couple of things. And I want to start with Titus 1.5, which is, this is a representative verse. There are other verses like this. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And this is kind of, this is the model that Paul, and then you see throughout the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament as well, is leadership by a team of elders. So there's Titus 1.5. Let's go Acts 20, verses uh, 17 and 18. And by the way, Acts 20, I mean, I think all of you all as ruling elders, you should have that tattooed on the inside of your eyeballs. It is so big. There's, the download in Acts 20 is just huge because you always learn the best stuff when, the, when there's a fight, right? And you all know there ain't no fight like a church fight, right? <laughs> So there's a church fight going on in Acts 20. So there's a bunch of stuff to learn. So verses 17 and 18. Now from Miletus, he, that's Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. And it just kind of goes on and on and on. We're going to pick up this conversation earlier, but I just want to point out to you that, sure, Paul was involved, you know, was crucial in terms of planting the church in Ephesus and the whole work and passing the torch to Timothy, and then I'm of the opinion that the torch was then passed to John the Apostle. Very interesting conversation. We can have that another time. But I want you to see that there were elders in place there. So like, hey, wait a minute, there are elders in place in Titus, or uh, Paul wants, excuse me, in, in Crete, Paul wants elders there. They are in place in Ephesus. Lots of other New Testament passages that we could go to, but how about we just, uh, oh, did I not put it in there? Um, Exodus, Exodus 24, 1, and uh, for some reason that slide didn't get dropped in, but glory be, I have it right here in my written notes. Then he said, this is the Lord, said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Okay, so again, I just put that in there, like I put Acts 20 in there, and like I put Titus 1 in there. The elders just keep showing up, you know? It must be like, this is a thing, you know? It's like actually in the Bible. All right, let's talk briefly about elders as a team, and I, I really appreciated what Anita uh, and Van had to say, and I, I want to just sort of codify it a little bit more specifically in the scriptures. Now, you guys, how many of y'all have like read this verse somewhere along the line? Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. So I had this incredible experience when I was in Israel, like, I don't know, it was about 30 years ago I was in Israel, and the archaeological dig at Megiddo, um, prophetically Armageddon, the dig at Megiddo, Megiddo had started to really mature. And most especially, they had really matured in the city gate area. And I was very interested in city gates. It's a big theme in scripture in terms of gates and what happens in the gates and it's like, yeah, man, you get to have the radar scope on with regard to the gates. 
And so I went in and uh, walked in through the city gate, and I was just fascinated by what I saw because I walked into the gate. It was a, just sort of a small area, and then I took a left turn. And um, it was kind of a forced left turn. There was no option. And sitting there, there were 12 seats. It was a single slab of stone where you could see that there were still, there were kind of individual seats, and they had been worn smooth. You could see the indentations from Israeli rear ends, you know, like from <laughs> centuries ago. And then you walk through there, and then you're, there was a forced right turn, another forced right turn, a forced left turn. And one thing that was very interesting to me was these were obviously kill zones. And it, I was uh, pastoring a church in Virginia, and you know, it's like loaded up with uh, Navy SEALs and Marines. And it's like, yeah, these are kill zones, man. And these are really good kill zones. They designed, it, defined, designed this very well. Why would you put kill zones there? Because the battle is always in the gates, right? If you're going to assault an ancient city, uh, the walls, they're shooting down at you, right? You try to force your way through the gates. And a few people could defend against a large army very effectively if the kill zones are well defined. At the same time, the elders take their seats in the city gates. Now, I, I may have this later in my notes, but I want to say it right now while I'm thinking about it. Does, does anybody know the derivation behind the word session? Seated, right. It's the Latin word sedere, to be seated. To be seated in council together there it is right there. There's the biblical root. So yet again, we Bible-believing Presbyterians, we got the lowdown on the scriptures, right? <laughs> the fact that they, they are seated and counseled together in the city gates, you think about what, why there as opposed to the center of the city. Well, it's about controlling what comes into the city or out of the city if you're fighting militarily. If you're part of the sp spiritual leadership team, all the significant questions are determined by who or what comes in and who or what goes out. And you want to really unpack that, you can go into the prophet Isaiah, and there's a, a bunch there. And then, of course, what's the first thing that Nehemiah takes on when he's rebuilding ancient Jerusalem? The gates. And the gates are specifically assigned to a very particular group of people. So understand the crucial nature of the gates, and this is where we're seated, um, both of us as ruling elders and teaching elders uh, together. All right. Now, here's another thing. This is really interesting. If you do a search in an ESV concordance, you, you know, do New King James or whatever you want to do, but a you know, fairly tight translation as opposed to a, a paraphrase, um, you will find that there are 195 references to the term elder in the Old and the New Testament. Twelve of them are singular. 183 of them are in the plural. And it's just profound. And it's, it's what Anita and Van were saying earlier. We operate as a team. Biblical leadership's a team sport. Um, and I thought they had some great statements to make about how you work together as a team. The, um, let's talk a little bit about the job description. And uh, Acts 20, verse 28. Remember I said like Acts 20, is, that's, that's like an important one. Pay careful attention to yourselves, Paul's still talking to the, to the elders in Ephesus, and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I want to talk a little bit about the terminology of elder and overseer. Because this, this is, there's a lot of important language here that we should pay attention to. And I, I edited these uh, slides. Yeah, here we go. So here's the, here's the beginning of this passage. Read it earlier, verse 17. Now, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Does anybody know what the New Testament Greek word for elder is? Presbyteros. Somebody should name a denomination after that, right? Oh, wait a minute. We already did that. Presbyterian means ruled by elders. Does anybody know the meaning of the term elder in the Old Testament? Not the word, but the meaning of the term. Well, close, very close. I'm looking for, I'm looking for, I mean, I got so many options here. <laughs> well, I tell you what, um, uh, John Price, John Price, stand up. 
Stand up. What color is John's hair? Gray. Gray. It means gray hair. Okay. Close enough, okay? Don't be a legalist on me. <laughs> that means he's even better than gray, okay? <laughs> it's gray on steroids. Gray making the jump to light speed. Okay, John, you can sit down. Thanks. The, um, and that's just kind of worth remembering. Now, I kind of like work through that. I'm like, okay, it's like the minimum age 55 or something. And I must say that I am biased towards older elders. And it's kind of funny. The older I get, the more I'm biased in this direction. <laughs> but I, I watch what's involved when you're really doing biblical leadership. And at a minimum, it takes an old soul. Whether, whether or not you're old chronologically, it, it takes an old soul. And for what it's worth, and, and I've served alongside some younger elders who've been superb elders. Um, the, um, but, and you can disagree with me on this. This is fine. I'm, I'm, you know, this is, I can't really chapter and verse make this argument from the scriptures. It's a general observation. I, I am of the mindset now, after it's hard to believe it, I just completed my 40th year in ministry. It was like, how did that happen? Um, the, um, it is amazing when you survive, isn't it? <laughs> Ain't no small accomplishment, guys. The, um, I like sessions that if they're not exclusively gray hair, there's a lot of gray hair on them. I also have come to understand the whole conversation about deacons in Acts uh, six, and you know how they step in and they take on a thorny issue. Different ways of understanding that, but the, you know, you, you all know the word diaconia means to serve. I am coming to the belief, and I would be glad to be corrected on this if somebody's like, "No, no, here's here's we got to parse this Greek a little finer." I actually think that the role of the deacons is to serve the session. I think that's what's in mind. Um, because they take on an issue that is taking down what is becoming the session in Jerusalem. It's the apostles, right? But by the time we get to Acts 15, it's the apostles and the elders were migrating. Uh, and I think that as younger um, individuals come on the session, I come on the diaconate, and they take various roles and responsibilities assigned to them by the session. It's a phenomenal training ground. They're being prepared. Now, different people have different ideas on this. I'm just giving you my thoughts for what it's worth. And you know, you might run into me a year from now, and I might say, yeah, actually, I changed my mind on that. <laughs> the, um, uh, but notice this. Now, this, this to me is fascinating. And, and I, I, if any of you all are committed Anglicans, I'd just say you're in the wrong place, because I'm going to step on your toes here a little bit. Now, notice Acts uh, 20, verse 17. He's speaking to the elders, and in verse 28, this is the same conversation. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So what, what do elders do? They oversee. And in fact, Van and Anita were talking about that earlier. We'll talk about the specifics of overseeing in a minute, but does anybody know what, I'm, I'm quizzing you guys here, so I apologize for that. Does anybody know what the Greek word for overseer is? Episcopos, exactly. And, and so, and it's often translated bishop. And so the Anglicans, you know, they'll say, you guys just got that wrong. You know, it's, it's bishops, man. You, you just clean up your act if you went with bishops. I must say, I love the new Anglican movement. It's phenomenal. I, if I wasn't a Presbyterian, I don't know, maybe I'd be an Anglican. I, I, don't know how they, I don't know if they let Anglicans preach in blue jeans rather than robes, so I, I don't know how it would work out. But, but I do think that we have it right. Because there are several passages of scripture that talk about the, um, it's almost a noun-verb relationship where elders are nouns. And even here, there's a noun overseer, but the, con but the concept is verb, right? It's an action, it's oversee. And so, you know, if you follow into a debate with you know, your Anglican neighbor next door, now you're, now you're equipped. Uh, to at least start the conversation. We'll see another passage in a little bit that speaks to that, but that elder, or I think elders oversee, and I actually think that's an important distinction because if we're using the word episkopos for the office of a bishop, it's no longer what elders do. 
But if we're using the term, as I think it is biblically faithful to do, as this is one of the functions of an elder, now we've dialed elders into this role of overseeing. This, as we will see when we get to 1 Peter 5, connects elders directly to the task of shepherding. All right, so two kinds of elders. This whole thing, have you ever been like, oh, the whole teaching elder, ruling, ruling elder thing, that's kind of dorky. We've probably made that up. Well, actually, we didn't. That's in the Bible, too. So 1 Timothy 5, 17, 5, 17 through 19. And by the way, I think when you understand that 1 Timothy is a leadership conversation, specifically between Paul and Timothy, and much of this conversation has to do with offices in the church, I think many of the interpretive difficulties that some people have with various passages begin to really clear up. So in 5, 17 through 19, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy. Oh, there might be some elders who rule. Wonder what we ought to call them. How about ruling elders? Wow, there's a concept. Um, of double honor, especially those. Now notice the phrasing here. There's a subcategory. There's a majority group, ruling elders, however large the majority may be. It's, at a minimum, let's just call it the plurality. There's a group within them called teaching elders, right? Or a group of elders whose job is to teach and to preach. Now, I, I tell you that for two reasons. The, the first is, is the more I've dug into this over the years, uh, the more I'm like, man, I, we kind of like got this pretty close to right. And I'm just glad when we get it right, as opposed to when we didn't. I think the Bible's the word of God, and this is the set of tracks we're going to run on. It just works out better that way. The, um, the other thing is this really helps us as we're serving on session together as ruling and teaching elders, right? It, it's, and, and in healthy sessions, there is an understanding that those who are teaching elders, they're, they're, they have this primary work of teaching and preaching. And if you're going to do it well, you're not writing your sermons on the back of a napkin while you stopped at Panera on your way in, right? There's a chunk of time that's involved in this. And, and I also want to say that one thing that I'm really glad about, and Rosemary, if I can just some, lob something in the direction of this group that's looking at training, which, which I, I think a lot of those ideas are great. They're consistent with ICME and when we were working on ICME together. But one thing I greatly appreciated was that when I was, uh, went through seminary, I was trained as a theologian. That's, that's how I was trained, which le left me incredibly deficient in other areas of life, and sometimes notoriously lacking in self-awareness. I'm still working on this, OK? The, um, but the conviction that my professors had was this. We're going to make you a Berean, a student of the word. We're going to, we're not even going to teach you the word. We're going to give you the tools. So for the rest of your life, you can rightly divide the word of truth. And that's been the pursuit of my life and every other teaching elder in here. What that does is in the leadership team, that makes us theologians. Now, here's the way local church works. You don't want many theologians. You just don't. We can, we can be a really difficult group of people, you know, pointy head to the max. But one, two, or three of them can be very helpful, especially since what you do as a church is theology. You know, somebody kind of needs to know this, but th there's a, there, it helps to know what everybody's contributing to the mix here. Um, and there's a sort of a sub-conversation on, on pulpits and you know, versus lecterns and who gets to stand behind a pulpit in a traditional church and the meaning of that related to ordination and on and on and on. Um, and I appreciated what uh, Ben and Anita were saying about ruling elders being able to preach. And I, I, it's always seemed to me that on any session I've served on, there, there have been one, two, or three ruling elders who are very, very capable uh, preachers and who could step in on a Sunday. But that does not change the fact that some of us have given our lives in a very unique way to the study of the word. And um, that's important, too. Um, all right, so the, uh, just that distinction between ruling and preaching el uh, teaching elders, I want you to see it's in the scriptures. It's drawn from the I mean, it's kind of stunning. It's like somebody was reading the Bible back then when they were working all this stuff out. Uh, um, 
The, uh, and we can have a big debate about verse 18, but we won't do it today. So ruling in the rule of Christ. So back to Proverbs, it's not 321, it's 3021 or 3121, you know, the elder who takes his seat in the city gates. So they're making judgments now. They're sitting there, and the elders, and you can look at, for example, the book of Ruth is a good example of this, but lots of other examples where elders are clearly deciding cases in their city they're seated as a court, and they are judging on the basis of the rule of law. This is the law of Moses, right? So they're making your decisions on what basis? The scriptures. And that's how we're meant to function. And sometimes in session meetings, I find myself, as a teaching elder, got a lot of really smart, great uh, Folks have always been on sessions that I've been serving on. Some of what I bring to the table is, well, I think these passages of Scripture would speak to this situation. And, you know, if, if I'm just really like living and breathing and drinking in the Word, then hopefully it's not too far away from bubbling up to the, to the surface. Um, the, but the idea is that as we rule, as the Old Testament elders did, we rule. We do. The, the word is prohistemi. It means to be set over. Um, the, uh, but there's a rule over us. And that rule, it was quoted earlier, and I really appreciated the fact that it was quoted, quoted, is to represent the mind of Christ. So is the mind of Christ with every happy thought that might occur to me while I'm sitting underneath the apple tree in my backyard? Where do we find the mind of Christ? In the scriptures. And I, I must say, we, I know I've done this in my life, and I, I bet we all have at some point or another. We've had some thought, something that we have said that seemed very good to us. But when you really examine it in light of God's word, it was mere sentimentality or somehow an idea that surely Jesus must have thought this. There's a great quote from a Bible teacher named Derek Prince, whom I have uh, appreciated over the, over the years, and, and in commenting on Jesus' statement in the Gospel of John, if you love me, you will love my commandments. Uh, Derek Prince, exegeting that verse, said, you do not love God more than you love his word. You do not know God more than you know his word. And you do not obey God more than you obey his word. And so this means that we are, all of us, ruling and teaching elders alike, on a lifelong journey into the word. And I don't know about you all. I mean, I, I turned 66 uh, yesterday. I still have so much to learn. I still find myself constantly growing and learning and expanding. And, you know, like for some people, the life goal is to watch as much NFL as possible. But well, that's OK. But for us, the goal is to more and more step into the word and uh, the self-attesting word of God. All right, so that, that's about just ruling in the rule of Christ. I'm still working through this job description deal. And uh, 1 Peter 5, 4. Well, this, uh, this is another big verse. I apologize for how small that is. That's bigger for you than it is for me. <laughs> So I exhort the elders among you. Okay, so we're in an elder conversation again, right? As a fellow elder, and this is fascinating, Peter, an apostle, was also an elder. And I think, some of you may have teased this out better than I have, I think that there's this transition going on from apostolic-based leadership of the New Testament, the apostles are going to die out, like the apostles, capital A, that is, to elder-led leadership, and I see, think we're seeing evidence right there. The Jerusalem Council, Acts 15, is another passage of scripture that I really encourage you all to, to digest. As a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, so right there he's saying he's an apostle, right? That's code language. I saw it with my own eyes. <clears throat> as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So here's a direct statement. Two elders shepherd the flock. It's part of the job description. Exercising oversight. So there's a form of that word episkopos again. <clears throat> now, 
not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So I just want to just connect some things here. Okay, it's a statement to elders. Part of the job is to not just sit on the stone seat, you know, make decisions, shepherd the flock. I, lo I love what you said about smell like sheep. There's another thing that, you know, really became very significant to me is that if you study shepherding, shepherds know sheep by name. And there's a time in my life where I was pastoring a very large church, and I, at best I maybe knew 10% of the congregation. And it's like, but I'm supposed to know them by name. They know me by name, and I'm supposed to know them by name. It's a, it's a really significant challenge. Uh, um, I think there's one more, yeah, exercising oversight. So again, see the connection. I, and there's just a whole complex of ideas there that, again, this would be a great passage just to kind of own. All right, so shepherding, how many of us, I'd like to know, the size of, now I'm not talking about people, the size of the flock, I'm talking about sheep. I'd like everybody to call out the number of sheep in your typical flock that you've shepherded through your lifetime. Sheep? Like, at, you really did it. No, 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 I'm talking about sheep. Yeah, bah, that, that kind of sheep. So, has anybody in here ever actually done this? Uh, man, you need to be doing this, not me. So, like, like, how many years did you shepherd for? All right, a year and a half. All right, so you're going to read the scriptures with different eyes than the rest of us. And, and you have this primary model, this word shepherding keeps coming back and back, and we are clueless. We just, like, know nothing about this. And a lot of us, we just import our own models and thoughts about leadership into this task. And a lot of us will bring, a, like, a business model in. And, and by the way, I mean, we all kind of watch this happen in the in the church during the late 80s, 90s, and into the probably the mid-2000s, the business model began to dominate the church. And, you know, it was all about nickels and noses and on and on and on and on. And, you know, so I've been kind of like in that for a while. It's something like that. I don't know. I don't know why this doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel right. I don't know. Everybody says this is the way you're supposed to do it, so I guess so. Does anybody know Tim Laniac? Yes. Yeah, it's like Tim's a great guy. So Tim was the dean of Gordon Conwell in Charlotte. And he realized, I'm training future pastors. I know nothing about this. This is the dumbest thing in the world. So he took a year's sabbatical. He went to the Middle East, and he lived among Bedouin shepherds for a year. And, and what's also cool is he took his son with him, who was, I think he was about 15 or so when he went, something like that. And he totally immersed himself in this world. And he's written a bunch of stuff, one of which is, the book you see on your right, I know you, it's hard to see, it's called While Shepherds Watch Their Flock. You know, you know how that phrase ends, while shepherds watch their flock? By night. It's nighttime now, isn't it? Okay. And it's this series of short chapters. There's maybe about 50 of them in there where, where he talks about the interface between Scripture and what he, how he actually saw the Bedouins living it out. And uh, I, I remember in my former church, we took about 100 uh, shepherd leaders through this. And we got better at caring for the flock as a, as a part of this. But all of us were shepherd leaders. I mean, we've seen that term come up again and again and again, most recently in 1 Peter 5 or Acts 20 or whatnot. So we need to learn what shepherding is, and, and Tim is a great resource. Now, how many of you all remember the old classic, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm by Philip Keller? You just got to read it. I mean, not only will you finally understand what's really going on in Psalm 23, there's so much of a download with regard to the work of shepherding. And uh, great, great resources. Um, so back to the job description. And again, this I had to like cram a bunch of stuff on here. So elders oversee. Um, elders 
rule and some among those ruling elders or those who teach and preach. Uh, the process of ruling according to, uh, why I put Proverbs 123. I think I meant to put the Proverbs 30 passage in there. Um, the uh, elders oversee and that gets us into the shepherding conversation. This is, if you, if you don't, out of this, you don't get anything else. Go get Tim Laniac's book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, excuse me, um, While Shepherds Watch Their Flock. You know this book, don't you? Go get it and read it. Or read it together as a session. Because it redefines leadership out of the, the American model that most of us have been unconsciously steeped in. Um, protect. Acts 20, 29. If we went just a little further in that Acts 20, Paul says to the Ephesian elders, Fierce wolves will come in among you. And this is part of the work. There's a certain amount of being a ruling or a teaching elder, it's hand to hand combat. And, you know, some of us, we got like scars, bites. In fact, I don't, let me just tell you this. You need to put your big boy pants on. Most of the time, it is the greatest thing in the world. Sometimes. It can be brutal. And if you're not willing to put your big boy pants on, then I, I don't know, you know, go hang out with somebody who does wear, like, go hang out with Howard. Howard wears his big boy pants. Go hang out with him, you know. I don't know how much I learned about big boy pants from Howard over the years. I think I learned a lot. Um, the, uh, but there's this process of protecting the flock. Um, lead by example, that's also in First Peter. Uh, five, Anita and Van talked about that. Prayer is part of it. Let the, if any, is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. You know that passage. So prayer is, uh, is a part of it as well. Here's three more books that I think are really good books. Bait of Satan by John Bevere. This is, a f so many of the problems that we have in the church come down to people being offended. And they do not handle it well. And they do not handle conflict well. Rosemary, you mentioned, uh, uh, sounds like a really, really good book. This book actually goes down a little bit more in terms of the spiritual attack that Satan brings into people's lives when they just become offended. This, this is quite a book and would be another really, really good read. Um, the Father Heart of God, I have a bunch of young guys I'll talk to you about in a minute. One of the things we did early on was we just read through the Father Heart of God Be because part of the criteria is you have to lead your family well, right? Well, what a, what a great place to start the conversation. And then this, this thing called the Westminster Confession of Faith. Do you know the value in the Westminster Confession? You know what makes that thing really sing? Does anybody know how many scripture references are in the Westminster Confession? A lot. 2,500. It is an incredible, I mean, if you're trying to figure out what the heck, this Trinity thing, what is this about? The confession's great. It's the footnotes, baby. <laughs> and there's this thing called hyperlinking now. <laughs> it's like, it's awesome. The, um, and that matters because 1 Timothy 3.9 says those who will serve as a ruling elder must hold the mysteries of the faith with a clear conscience. Um, and I think Westminster will help you. All right, so, all right, can, can, can I have like two minutes? All right, so two minutes. Your next generation of elders. Because um, we, we were talking about that. They were talking about it a little bit earlier. So all of those young folks in your church, they're, they're looking for a path to leadership. I, I, especially, I think, the young men. Not exclusively so, but I think the young men. The, they're looking for a path to leadership, and if they find a path to leadership in your church, they'll hang around. If not, then if they're worth their salt, they're going to go someplace else because they're wired to lead. And so you've got to make the way to leadership very, very clear for them. Um, I, I, have a, I have a group of 25 young men, predominantly in their 30s, and the name of our group is Eldering Before You Elder. And, you know, they all got the download. Yeah, it's a gray hair thing. Yeah, and they, you know, are probably not coming on session until we're 45 or 55 or, you know, whatever it is. But they also understand that in healthy congregations, 
Elders are not elected, they're recognized. And the congregation confirms what they've seen people doing all along, acting like shepherd leaders. Um, and so with this group of young guys, it's kind of like, guys, let's start eldering now and learn what this is about and grow into this so that maybe in 10 years or 20 years, whenever it is, the congregation are like, yeah, you know, Frank, I mean, wow, he's a shepherd. He's a shepherd leader. He should serve on session. Um, so with this group of 25 young men, we meet the first Saturday of every month. And we worship some, and we pray some, and then we, we just study. Um, and uh, there are some people who still think that's an OK thing. Um, and here's the track that we have. Um, we're on a four-year plan. Now, I must say, I did not start with this four-year plan. I just got these guys together, and I was like, let's study what the Bible has to say about being an elder. And they're like, cool. And that's kind of what we did the first year. We just like went through these passages of scripture that we went through and a bunch more. And you know, let's define what this is about. Uh, year two right now, we're, we're doing a study on all the mighty men of scripture. And you know, like David and Boaz and Jephthah and Gideon and their strengths and their weaknesses. And what's this teach us? Because you know, and we're a complementarian church, and so our, our context is, is, you know, guys, if you're going to serve, you have to understand that shepherds will def must defend the flock. And so this is going to take, this is, there are going to be some battles that you're going to be in. So let's have this mighty man conversation. And we're, we're in that now, and we we'll have that finished in the next few months. Then after that, I think we're going to go deep onto uh, shepherding. We'll probably reach, read the Leniak book and also the Philip Keller book. And that'll help them a lot as dads and husbands as well, and just leadership in general and whatever business context they're in, because shepherd leaders are the best leaders. Um, and then after that, they're already paying on me. They, they're kind of like, man, what's this Westminster Confession thing? And I'm like, we'll get there. We'll get there, you know? So that's kind of our track. And these guys are all in subgroups. So there's a, there's a Saturday morning group that meets once a month. And then there's a group of guys that meet um, the second and fourth Monday of every month. We meet at 7 AM. And this is just, we're going through Romans verse by verse by verse. So they really understand how to read the Bible. That's the goal. They'll learn Romans in the process. But the real goal is, as one guy said, I'm tired of reading my Bible like an I Ching stick. In other words, I'm looking for my like happy thought for the day, Christian fortune cookies. <laughs> Nate, how do you really do this thing? How do you really study it? So like, like we're like in deep, and they know that we just go a chunk at a time, and they have to come up with five really good questions every time. Because if they can't come up with really good questions, that gets them deep into the text, and we're, we're off and running. That, that's, that's like a fabulous group. And then there's a group of geeks that uh, together, and they, they, they meet first and third. And that group of geeks has selected the book, Carl Truman's Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. That's a great book. But that's a geek book. Um, but that's engendering a lot of valuable conversation. Um, there's a Sunday school class for them with their wives so that they're, hey, look, the first test is your family, right? Got to do that well. And then there's a Thursday night group uh, for them as young couples as well. And we're, we're looking, you know, it's kind of like, you guys with your wives need to either be in the Sunday school class or the Thursday night group, so we're checking the family box. And then you got to be in one of these other small groups, so we're like diving down deep because once a month is, is not enough training. Now, this sounds like a lot of stuff, and if we were trying to do it in 18 months, it would be. But this is a 10-year conversation um, because none of us became elders overnight, right? We, we grew into it. So it, it, this whole thing about like, yeah, it's a bunch of gray hairs, but, but who, who's got the blonde hair or the red hair or the black hair or the brown hair? Who's the next generation? And I, I bet that your church is just like our church. There, there are folks just waiting around. They're just itching. They may not even know they're itching. But you say, hey, how about if we talk about what it is to take the senior leadership role in the life of this church? Would you be interested in that? They are all interested in that. Okay. Yep.